While AI chatbots and AI generated videos both feels like black magic, it doesn't mean that they are both born equally. They are indeed machine learning concepts, but just look at this. This is the math for attention in language modeling, and this is the math for only the denoising process in diffusion for image generation. On top of that, the majority of progress in language modeling has come not from architectural changes, but from scaling up data in model size. While image generation is currently on its fourth architectural evolution that went from GANs, VQGAN plus clip, latent diffusion, and now diffusion transformers, language modeling has been sitting on transformers this whole time. With each and every one of the image generators being a mathematical hell that makes you wonder, how in the world did people come up with this? As for video generation, the same machine learning idea from image generation could be applied too. And of course, it would be more complicated since it needs to accommodate the time dimension in order to have it become a video generator. So in this video, I'll be providing a conceptual overview of how video generators are made. This won't be a detailed mathematical breakdown, so if you're looking for something more technical, I'll link them down in the description. But it seems no one has created an explanation video on diffusion transformer-based video generator yet, which is unfortunate. And since there is barely any fully open-sourced research about high-quality video generation like Sora, people like us have no way to really learn how it's made and built from the ground up. Like if you ask anyone that knows Sora how does DIT for video generation work, they would most likely not know anything about it. But luckily, the open source god has blessed us with this project called Open Sora. Developed by a bunch of brilliant open source researchers, it contains the golden knowledge we need in learning how Sora or even a decent video generator is actually made. But before we dive into it, let's take a big step back and understand the core objectives we are dealing with. So video generation can be summarized into two key challenges. The first is the generation quality, basically how visually appealing and realistic each frame of the video looks. Since image generation has made significant advances, video generation often builds on these techniques to create high quality individual frames. So this is not as big of a challenge as image generation has been pretty much perfected. The second challenge is temporal consistency. This involves making sure there are smooth transitions and coherent motion across frames. And so far, achieving seamless temporal consistency remains the most difficult aspect of video generation to this day. While it may sound simple, it requires simulating complex dynamics and sticking to the laws of physics to make movements appear natural and believable between frames. That's why people call video generators a world simulator, as it essentially needs to do what a physics simulator is able to do for every possible and logical motion we can imagine. Which brings us to the latest configuration of Open Sora. Since image generation models are already really good, so rather than reinventing the wheel, Open Sora adapted an existing and powerful text-to-image model called PixArt Alpha. Even if you're not familiar with the name, you may have come across it, not for its image generation, but for that one controversial carbon emission diagram published in its research paper. Despite the controversy, PixArt Alpha is still known for being an efficiently trained, high-quality image generation model, making it an ideal choice for cost savings, especially considering how GPU-poor the open-source researchers are. This text-to-image model is also a diffusion transformer model, which means unlike standard diffusion-based models, it doesn't use units to process images, that is, to obtain fine details and big features through compressing and expanding an image. Instead, this model uses a transformer to replace the part to process images. Why the switch? So the image generation researchers probably looked over at the language model researchers and saw their state-of-the-art architecture has not changed at all in the past few years, which gave rise to using an NLP architecture for image generation tasks. And it works. All you have to do is to make the transformer denoises. Some suspect that while units are great at processing local patterns, transformers are better at capturing global patterns in data thanks to its attention mechanism. This means that DIT models can potentially offer better understanding of complex relationships across large image dimensions, even with the addition of time dimension, which would not make more sense when we need to consider temporal consistency in video generation. So a slight modification is needed from the PixArt Alpha structure. Okay, so do you see that one multi-head self-attention block? That block is the part of the model that would understand the compositions of an image, aka a spatial attention block. So to also make the model understand the changes between frames, another multi-head self-attention block is added, which is called the temporal attention block. So after the modifications, this is how the transformer layer roughly looks like now, with a bit of simplification, of course. And as you give the diagram a closer look, you would notice two things that are going into the transformer layer. One of them is injecting the video that is processed through a VAE encoder 
encoder and the other is injecting the prompt that is processed through a T5 text encoder. If you know what clip is, the T5 text encoder is just clip but more descriptive, but if you are unfamiliar, the T5 text encoder essentially converts input text into a sequence of latent representations. That basically means it converts the semantic meaning from the input text into numbers, which then can be used to guide and condition the model much more efficiently. For the VAE encoder, since processing images directly in the pixel space is highly inefficient, a trainable VAE encoder is used to compress images into a latent representation that retains the essential image information which makes it very efficient to process. So the same approach is applied to video frames as well. But the temporal information between frames needs to be stored too for video generation, right? So what the researchers did was to yoink an existing 2D and 3D VAE, which are from SDXL and MacVITV2 respectively, then mix them together and fine tune it to make this open Sora VAE to encode video frames. With SDXL's 2D VAE, it already has a really strong 2D feature representations, and by adding the 3D VAE on top, they hope the 2D feature representations can also help comprehend the temporal dimension which the 3D VAE provides the processing space for. But since the temporal information doesn't need to be updated as frequently, the temporal signal is then weaker where it's only applied once every 4 frames. Well, that is to also save processing power of course. The T5 is inserted from the side to also suggest it is conditioning the model. So in the generation stage, you just need to pass in a noisy latent condition on the T5 which is your text prompt, then the model will basically run as a denoising transformer where you iteratively take out the less denoised output at the end and put it back into the front to denoise it even further. Then the fully denoised output will be reformatted together as a generated video. But if the whole generation process still confuses you, let's turn it into an analogy. You can imagine a noisy latent like a 3D cuboid, the X and Y is the image size and the Z is the fixed amount of frames. And you can think of the whole denoising process like baking a bread where you put the noisy latent which is like a bread dough that doesn't expand into a fixed container which is like a baking mold and the denoising transformer is like the oven that would denoise the cuboid which is like baking the dough and turn it into a bread. The T5 is like choosing what ingredients the bread uses which will determine what type of bread it will come out at the end. Once the cube is finished baking, it will not be noisy anymore and you would take the bread out of the container. And now you can reconstruct this cuboid into a video. I have definitely oversimplified things but this is the basic video generation logic right here and let me know if you do want to dedicate a video on diffusion transformers if this was not clear enough. So now that's out of the way, all that's left is to replicate the features and functions that Sora has. As outlined in OpenAI Sora's report, the key features besides its architecture is that back when Sora is trained, the training data is able to maintain its original resolution, aspect ratio, and video length during training. As a result, this enhances the flexibility, framing, and composition of the model. So open Sora's researchers have three ideas in mind to replicate Sora's training method. The first is using an AVIT, which supports dynamic resolution sizes and video length within the same batch using masking with minimal efficiency loss. Using the baking analogy, this is like setting the container for the bread to be elastic. However, the elastic container will be complex to make, aka hard to implement, and since it will not be metal that conducts the heat well due to it being elastic, which means it may not fully utilize optimized kernels like flash attention, it will take a lot of time to bake. The second method is padding, which supports dynamic resolution sizes and video length by padding within the same batch. So since the bread needs to fit the baking container perfectly, and you can leave any gaps between the bread and the container, you would pad things within the baking container to make it fit. But this method is not ideal because first you need to pad different dimensions to the same size, and second, the impurities that come from the padding would make the bread taste bad. So you need to either unify the dimensions for all the breads or the baking containers. Which brings us to the third method, bucketing, which supports dynamic sizes across different batches by having different dimensions of baking containers. So instead of padding the bread, you can sort the bread based on the type of container it will fit in. Though all items within the same batch must have the same dimensions, and only a fixed set of resolutions can be applied. And keep in mind, this baking analogy is imperfect, because the training stage now kind of doesn't make sense where we are essentially putting a baked bread into the oven, but the generation stage do still follow the actual logical baking process, where a noisy latent that is like a dough is put into a baking 
baking container and shoved into an oven, then guided using T5. Okay, anyways, given its simplicity, the researchers chose the bucketing method. While bucketing has some limitations, these concerns are minor as they do not significantly affect the performance. So that does also sets up the very basics of resolution and video length controls for the users. But the real fun is the generative video editing tasks. For things like setting an initial frame or an ending frame, this is also one of the most appreciated functionalities that an AI video generator can offer. And in order to achieve this, a masking strategy is needed. Here's how it works. For adding these type of functionalities, certain frames are unmasked, meaning they are visible to the model and provide conditioning, while other frames are masked or hidden and need to be generated. The unmasked frames are assigned at a time step of zero, signaling the model to treat them as reference points, while the masked frames retain their original time step, indicating they should be predicted. At first, this strategy produced poor results when applied directly to a pre-trained model because the model hasn't been trained to condition on frames. To address this, the researchers introduced a random masking strategy. During training, frames in the data were randomly unmasked at different intervals such as the first frame, the last frame, or just some random time steps, which allows the model to encounter a variety of conditioning scenarios. This way, the model could learn how to manage different combinations of masked and unmasked frames, improving its ability to handle image and video conditioning tasks. In practice, this random masking strategy was applied with a 50% probability during training, meaning that half the data included masking while the other half did not. However, this masking strategy will create a slight drop in performance for text and video generation. But if we use a lower masking probability, like 30%, it will result in much worse conditioning capabilities, which shows that striking the right balance during training is critical. Nonetheless, this masking strategy provides the model ability to handle image and video generation tasks in a flexible and dynamic way, which makes them much more useful even at the trade-off with generation quality. And to recover from the generation quality drop-off, as usual, we would need more data. And so preparing the training data for video generation with a lot of dimension that you need to consider, the data processing pipeline is definitely going to be a nightmare. It goes something like video scene cut, aesthetic filtering, optical flow score, optical character recognition, add captioning to videos, match scores, caption camera motions, a lot of miscellaneous cleaning, then we have the data set, which is a really complicated process and definitely sound like a boring one. So let's not be bothered with that. Instead, you should try out Luma's dream machine that implements the masking strategy that we just talked about, which is much more fun than listening to some data curation rambling. If you missed out getting Rickrolled in the other video, here's another showcase where you can get a shot of a bar to an actual bar that pens into a Rickroll or a busy street. That's actually just Rick Astley vibing in in his music video. This was done using the latest version of their keyframe function, which lets you select both an initial and an ending frame. So to get the result above, you can choose the image to start the video and put an ending frame that is taken from any frame from the Rickroll. There are various other services like Runway or Pika that offer similar controls, but none of them provide this unique pipeline allowing you to choose both frames simultaneously while also have the state of the art quality. For me, Luma Stream Machine is probably the most fun and memeable service to use. So to get started with Luma Lab Stream Machine, check them out by using the link down in the description to get started for free. And thank you Luma Labs for sponsoring this video. If you enjoyed today's technical explanations, I also cover a lot of the other latest research on diffusion models, vision language models, and multimodal models on my newsletter where I don't find the time to make videos for. There's only one issue per week, so I wouldn't be spamming your mailbox. And alongside three research papers per issue, it'll also contain some important industry news recaps so you don't miss out. And thank you for watching. A big shout out to Andrew Laschelius, Chris Ledoux, Deegan, Miguelim, Robert Zaviasa, Luis Muck, Ben Shainer, and many others that support me through Patreon or YouTube. Follow my Twitter if you haven't, and I'll see y'all in the next one.